Good morning, Sabbath School class. Again, we're having an interactive discussion with two panel members. We hope in the near future that uh, we can again meet in the sanctuary as a, an adult Sabbath School class. But until that time, we'll have this interactive study. Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we study your word and your lessons for us, we ask that your Holy Spirit guide our minds, our words, our thoughts and actions, that we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a new quarter. Last week was our first study, as you recall. And I'm going to repeat myself just a bit from last week. In the introduction to our lesson quarterly, which is on education, there were these words, Scripture and its message of creation and redemption must be central to all Christian education. And I thought, spot on. That's Seventh-day Adventists to the core. We Adventists are creationists. We believe that God created the family in Eden, perfect in His image. And when they did fall, He had a plan of redemption. So it was Eden as created, and we're looking forward to Eden restored. And your lesson authors had these words. The topic for our lesson this quarter, what does it mean to have a Christian education? And that's in quotes. Christian education and how can we as a church, in one way or the other, find a way for all our members to be able to get such an education? When the words Christian education come up, most Seventh-day Adventists think of our parochial schools. And we have the largest number of parochial schools, second only to the Roman Catholic Church. I'm high on parochial education. My three daughters went from first grade through college at our Christian schools. I went to a Christian boarding academy as a teenager and it changed my life. So I'm high on that. But many people don't have this opportunity. And so what we're studying about in this quarter is the total lifelong process of education. Christian education. Again, Christian education in quotes. Not just Christian schools, but study of the Scripture, uh, church involvement in education in many ways. And last week's lesson was on the first education in Eden. And I'd like to refer back to the very first page of last week because I noticed the same quote in the quarterly this week. It's from Ellen White in the book Education, and she says, The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The Creator Himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. Now that was the perfect setup, wasn't it? Mike, if that could have perpetuated from generation to generation, the world would have been a different place, right? Absolutely would have, Lonnie. We, uh, we would probably see a much smoother functioning global society than what we have right now. <laughs> We have a dysfunctional society, don't we? It's a bit of an understatement. The um, first family started out uh, perfect uh, from the hand of God. I always like to look at that genealogy. Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch. That's first, uh, the last three generations you skip down. The son of Seth, the son of, of Adam, the Son of God. Adam was a son of God just like those sons of God described in Job. And Adam should have been there with them in the councils of heaven. But because of his fall, 
Satan was there as an, uh, as an intruder in his stead. This week, we're studying about that same first family to start with after the fall. Steve, if you'd be so kind, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. This is a little repeat from what we had last week, but it sets the pace, I think. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why, why art thou wroth, and why is thy, thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou, and thou shalt rule over him. Steve, I'm going to read from a modern translation here, just a little bit on that. I, I'm really struck by these words from the Lord. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, and you must master it. I don't know why I didn't see this before, but these words really impressed me with the kindness of our God. Cain had shown total disrespect for the Lord's instructions. And the Lord simply, in a kind way, tried to lead him back with these words. He didn't condemn him. He gave him a positive, how shall I put it, a positive counsel on how to get a mastery over sin. I thought, how remarkable. Kindness of our Lord in this. Now, from these simple texts, what do we know about their knowledge of what God expected of them. Why did Abel bring a slain animal? Well, clearly he understood that there needed to be an atonement or an intercession for wrongdoing. And so that was probably his understanding. Absolutely, Mike. And I think it, it said that Adam and Eve had instructed these young boys as they grew up, as to what the Lord demanded of the pair for redemption. That the, that the promise of redemption was contingent upon this sacrifice. So they, they had been instructed by the first family. There's every evidence of this. And Mike, I went to the book Patriarchs and Prophets just to get a little better understanding of that. And... In Patri Patriarchs and Prophets, it's pointed out that these boys had considerably different personalities. And we a can see that in this passage as well. Absolutely. Abel was a, a, a gentle person uh, following the Lord to every instruction that had been given to Adam and Eve from God. Yeah. And Cain, on the other hand, it's a very evident here that there's a rebellious spirit. He, he knew better. He knew that without the shedding of blood, there could be no re, uh, redemption. No redemption. And while they only had a, uh, an imperfect understanding of the Savior to come, they knew that it would require sacrifices to point to that. So why is he bringing fruit instead of 
instead of a, a, a lamb, do you think, uh, ooh, 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 ooh. Steve? Well, I think, you know, there's, there's so much to this story that, is, is, that we, we don't know. We could spend the whole time, couldn't that, we? That we don't know, right? We don't know how old Cain was when he killed Abel. So this, this, this system of, of bringing sacrifices to the Lord, maybe Cain started off bringing a living sacrifice and, and being obedient, and maybe over time he wandered away from that. I'm, I think you're spot I'm on. Sure, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that Adam and Eve instructed their kids about their fall, about the mistakes that they made in not obey, obeying God. So you can see maybe that maybe both Cain and Abel, Abel started off worshiping God the way God instructed them to bring an offering and worship. And maybe over time, Cain allowed Satan to come into him and, 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 and move away from that. I don't have to be obedient to God to, in order to serve him. I can serve him the way I want to serve him. I think that's excellent. The, the evidence is, is there that they both knew what was required. And I think that... Um, you know, Lonnie, one other thing. I, I, I think it bears mentioning rebellion is virtually never an isolated incident. That's right. It is almost always an outcome of a certain trajectory in a person's life. A certain path, and, isn't and it? And yeah. Steve, you are absolutely right. I am sure these kids were instructed in the same way. But for whatever reason and in whatever process, Cain stopped spending as much time in God's presence as Abel did clearly. And the outcome is a rebellion that displeases God. This probably wasn't a one-off incident for him. I couldn't agree more. And ultimately we know that Cain's self-destruction was complete in the slaying of his brother. You know, they were probably raised up to be kindred spirits and believers in the same all-powerful and creative God. But the real lesson for those of us in every age is how committed are we to stepping into God's presence every day? And, and, and Cain obviously struggled with that. And I think you see here, Mike, that Cain is working his own way instead of dependence upon God and taking God at his word. He's doing it his way, and that's rebellion. You remember in Samuel, it says, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. <laughs> it's tied right into Satan, and that was the problem here. Let's um, shift gears here a bit and um, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. Mike, if you'd be so kind. 5 through 9, you say? Yes. And thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be upon thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when there thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be, <laughs> excuse me, they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gates. You know, these words have inspired generations, millennia of God followers. The Absolutely. Hebrews, the uh, modern day Jews, where they'll put. Uh, you know, a scripture in a little box upon their, on their forehead foreheads, or yeah. upon the, the doorpost of their home, and they'll yeah. touch it with their hand yeah. as they go in. Exactly. And, and Moses, in writing this, uh, is really quoting the Lord here. This is what you do. And did you notice there that it needs to be in the heart to be effective? These things you're teaching to your children, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. You need to have that as a deep conviction as a parent to pass it on to the children here. Yeah. Now we've got some uh, real examples. Uh, the real title of this uh, subsection of the lesson is Israeli families. 
families of Israel. And I would like to bring up about three examples that are remarkable in that they show what a few years up front from a mother can do to affect in a highly spiritual way uh, the way the child develops and goes into an adult. The first uh, example I'd like to give you is Moses as a child. Steve, if you would look up Exodus 2, 1 to 10, just briefly here. Okay, Exodus 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Yes. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife of the daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not hide him any longer, she took for him in an ark of bush bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the, uh, the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw a child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call for thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she should nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew thee out of the water. Now a little context here. Remember, this was a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, right? And from 70 souls or whatever it was that came uh, out of Canaan uh, of, of Joseph's uh, relatives, including his father Jacob, they had now increased in number to probably around 2 million people. And Pharaoh felt threatened and to the point that he's saying, kill all the male babies. And so this is what is happening here. And the Lord is remarkably saving this young child. How many years was she with the mother? Was he with the mother? Um, it, it says she grew up and, and brought him to the Pharaoh's daughter and he became his son. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Again, I got this from Patriarchs and Prophets, about 11 or 12 years. 11 or 12 years for a mother to make an impact on somebody here. Now, Moses is no ordinary human being. I want to read a couple things from Patriarchs and Prophets on this. At the court of Pharaoh, Moses received the highest civil and military training the monarch had determined to make his adopted grandson his successor on the throne, and the youth was educated for a high station. And quoting um, Stephen from Acts 7, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Get this. His ability as a military leader made him a favorite with the armies of Egypt. And he was generally regarded as a remarkable character. Further down in that, we don't have time to go into it much, but it quotes from, uh, from Hebrews 11. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to, annoy, to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect into the recompense of reward. That's Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 26. Now get this. Moses was fitted to take preeminence 
among the great of the earth to shine in the courts of his most glorious kingdom and to sway the scepter of its powers. His intellectual greatness distinguishes him above the great men of all ages. As historian, poet, philosopher, general of the armies, and legislator, legislator, he stands without peer. Now, all of this, and he's set to be Pharaoh's successor, and the Pharaohs came from the priestly caste, and they worshiped the heathen gods, and there was extreme pressure on Moses to cave in and worship these gods, and he would not. And he held out. And all of this can be traced back, Mike, to 11 or 12 years at a mother's teaching. There are a couple of things that really jump out at me, and I have read that passage before from Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets, and it is astounding. When we look at the most impressive worldly leaders today, and if we, if we take to heart what she wrote in that passage that you just shared, Lonnie, they pale in comparison to who Moses was as a human being. You know, the first thing that really sticks out to me is, is of all of the lessons he learned in those 11 or 12 years with his mother, I wonder if humility was the most compelling lesson he was asked to embrace. Because you think about this, this was a young man, I mean relatively young, 40 years for that, at the for most, that context yeah. anyway. He was in line to become the most powerful human being on earth. That's right. The known earth. And that's way beyond the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. That's go. way beyond that. Way beyond. And, and yet, the humility that somehow uh, his mother instilled in him, and we know it wasn't just his mother, and this is the second thing that jumps out to me. How much minute-by-minute minute presence in the Holy Spirit, in front of the Holy Spirit, did that mother reveal to her son for those 11 or 12 years? Because what happened, the decision Moses made, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my human understanding around yes, it. Exactly. With all of the trappings, all of the power, all of the ego that a young man typically develops when he's being given an awful lot of attention, when he's handsome to look at and intelligent and has authority, there's an awful lot of ego development that takes place there. And later, Mike, he would say that he was the humblest <laughs> of all men, you know. Now, it, it, it's he had to do some change. It? He had to go out in the wilderness for 40 years and a few things like that. But I, I think the roots of this went back to that mother. It, it is remarkable. Yeah, it's remarkable. And what a powerful lesson for every one of us in what we should pursue. Right. My second example... Uh, Steve and Mike, uh, I've chosen Hannah, mother of Steve of uh, of Samuel. And um, what do we know about that? Here's a man, Elkiah, that has two wives, but he's a godly man, and it's evident from the scriptures that Hannah is his favorite. But Penina, her rival, is making life absolutely miserable because she has children and Hannah does not. And they go to the yearly feasts, and Eli is the high priest at that time. And Anna, or Hannah, rather, in bitterness of soul, entreats the Lord to give her a son. And Eli thinks she's drunk when he sees her mouth moving and doesn't realize what's going on, but she assures him that she's not, but she wants this. Eli is impressed enough to say, go in peace and the Lord give you what you've asked. And lo and behold, <laughs> the Lord does that. And her vow to the Lord is that 
If he will open her womb and give her a son, she will dedicate this young son back to him for life. For life. And she keeps that promise. A year later they return, and here's this young... No, I'm off, off the track a bit. She's still weaning him a year from that time. And her husband and other wife and children go back to the feast. But the year later, she comes with him and gives him to Samuel and said, He's yours for the Lord forever. And interestingly enough, out of that experience the Lord allowed her to have several other children <laughs> just as a, a reward for her faithfulness. Now we look at Samuel and what Samuel did as a high prophet for Israel. And we can say the roots, the foundation for his spiritual maturity came from a relatively short experience with his mother. It must have been profound, Mike. Yeah. Two years. Absolutely. Not, not uh, 12 years or 11 years like Moses' mother, but only a couple years. So, Lonnie, do you think we as fathers kind of get an easy out? Because <laughs> it's always the mothers who seem to have this profound impact on their, on their children's early development. Well, I noticed the lesson today, Mike, said fathers and mothers. <laughs> Thank goodness. <You're laughs> so we don't get the easy out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, the Lord, in his infinite wisdom, did engineer us differently, didn't he? As fathers and mothers. The mothers have that tremendous impact on, uh, on the children. I, I love this story about Hannah and Samuel. And I, I looked for other examples in the Bible that I might uh, touch on. And I'd like to ask you for an example. Steve, do you have one? Well, I just wanted to add to the story of Hannah. H how easy could it have been for Hannah to have said, look, I, I made those promises when I was under duress. Um, I, I, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm, I mean, how easy would it have been for her later on in life to say, you know, Lord, I was, I was really du under duress and I was really upset and sorrowful. And Surely easy, you will understand. Yeah, <laughs> surely you'll understand if I don't give my son back to you. I, I, I think that speaks to the character of, of Hannah. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the character that she passed on to her son to say that, look, I am going to... I, I am going to live up to the, to, the, to the promises that I've made to God here and to give my son back to God. And, and I think that lesson to us parents is, look, at some point, we've got to give our kids to God. Amen. At some point, they're not going to be babies anymore. They're not going to be small kids. They're going to grow up. And at some point, we've got to let them go and put them in God's hands and say, Lord, you gave them to me. I did what you have assigned to me to do. And now I'm going to trust you to carry them through life. Right. And so yeah. I think that's, the, that's the, the example that I see in Hannah's life. That, that she said, Lord, I'm gonna, you've been faithful to me. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to turn my kids back over to you. And I'm going to trust you. I couldn't agree more, Steve. And I think that um, in Hannah's, you know, I, as you read on the scripture, she comes to the feast and brings a little robe for him and, and things, you know, just to, as he's growing up under Samuel, uh, under Eli, rather, she is nurturing him some more. But absolutely powerful influence on that young man. Steve, I, I looked for some other examples, and somehow I gravitated to Abraham. You say, why Abraham? You know, the writer of Hebrews said that uh, Abraham was a hundred and, and uh, uh, 
Sarah was about 90, Abraham almost as good as dead. A little bit of hype there because he did live to be, live to be 175. <laughs> but, you know, they were old people when the promised son came. And the Lord specifically said to Abraham and Sarah that in this young boy, all of the earth would be blessed. His descendants would be like the stars of heaven. Uh, there, he repeated all of the promises he'd given to Abraham to fall on Isaac. Okay? And I go to those, those texts in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, they're my favorite in all of Hebrews 11. Let me give you a little context here again. The Lord, having promised all this, drops this bomb on Abraham and says, I want you to take this only begotten son of yours and offer him as a sacrifice to me. And as you study the scriptures and as you, as you read out of Patriarchs and Prophets, there could not have been a more crushing blow to Abraham than this. How does he reason this out, Mike? The Lord said, in all, in your son Isaac, just as I promised you when I asked you to come out of Mesopotamia down here to Canaan, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. Now it's going to pass on to Isaac. How can this be if Isaac is sacrificed? You know, I've heard so many people through the years question Abraham's character. You know, he was a man who was given to stretching the truth or telling lies or deception. And yet, um, Lonnie, you bring up something that, frankly, as a father of two sons, is unimaginable to me. To have waited so long for this promise, to have been so completely overwhelmed by God's goodness because the promise was, was realized in this child, Isaac. And then, can you imagine what a wrestling match, a spiritual wrestling match Abraham must have experienced when he was first given the injunction to, to sacrifice your child? Take the child three days from here and offer him up as a sacrifice. Can you imagine the spiritual wrestling match Abraham must have had? How can I do this, God? Are you kidding me? That's right. And, and Mike, by this time, he's about 112 years old. Yeah. And uh, this is a great burden to him. He, as he tries to carry this out, he can't even tell his wife, Sarah. He has nobody that he can confide in, and he does this. And Mike, I'd like to go to those verses in Hebrews here uh, because they are so remarkable. It says here in Hebrews, by faith, 17th verse, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, it was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. Now i got to tell you, this is about 2,000 years after creation. In all of Scripture we can find no evidence that there had to ever been anybody raised from the dead. And probably there would not be anybody raised from the dead until God raised Moses about 500 years later. And yet this dear old saint said, I trust God. What is faith? Taking God at His word. God said that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through this Son. Therefore, if God is going to keep His word, He's going to have to bring this boy back to life. 
And Mike, I, I went again <laughs> to my, I love the Con Conflict of the Ages series. Those five books, to me, are just marvelous. Aren't they marvelous? And I, I read this, talking about where they're building the altar. You know, he leaves the men, takes only Isaac and the wood and everything, and goes up there and builds that altar on top of, of Mount Moriah. And it says, at the appointed place, they built an altar and laid the wood upon it. Then with trembling voice, Abraham unfolded his son, the divine message. It was with terror and amazement that Isaac learned his fate, but he offered no resistance. He could have escaped his doom had he chosen to do so. The grief-stricken old man, man, exhausted with the struggle of those three terrible days, could not have opposed the will of a vigorous youth. Now get this. But Isaac had been trained from early childhood to ready, trusting obedience. And as the purpose of God was opened before him, he yielded a willing submission. Again, this goes back to early training. Man. What a beautiful Man. example of God-centeredness Abraham was every day. And Mike, as you pointed out, and you and uh, Steve pointed out, imperfect man, lying right. twice about his, his wife, not being his wife, but his sister. And she was a half-sister to him, you know, and all of that. But still, we say Abraham, the friend of God. Yeah. God really considered this man special. Right. Um, but I, I just was struck by this. Trained from childhood to be this. And when it came down, and it goes on to say, he was a sharer in Abraham's faith, and he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life as an offering to God. He tenderly seeks to lighten the father's grief and encourages his nervous hands to bind the cords that confine him to the altar. I mean, it, it is an incredible story. But I, I tell you, those verses from Hebrews, uh, the author of Hebrews had it spot on. Uh, the old man reasoned that if God was going to keep his word in one direction, he's going to have to resurrect that yeah. boy if I kill him. Amen. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and Lonnie, you know, sometimes we focus so much on the faith that Abraham had to have to, to believe, okay, even if I go through this and obey the Lord, he can resurrect Isaac. Absolutely. But, but if we look at it from the other side, how much faith did Isaac have to have to say, Lord, I know you can resurrect me That's if right. I offer myself as a sacrifice? Because Isaac knew the same promise, right? That That's through right. Isaac, right, the, 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 the promise was to be kept. So he said Isaac's here, faith. He said here, Steve, he was a share in Abraham's faith. Amen. Amen. A share in his father's Amen. faith. So where did Isaac get the faith from, right? That, had to be that from his those father parents. Abraham had. Had to be that dear had, mother Sarah. Had to be and, passed and, on yeah. by his parents. Yeah. Amen. Well, these are my three examples <laughs> that go back to early child training. Now, let's shift gears again. And... Uh, we're doing reasonably well on, uh, on time here, but let me read one thing here from uh, the book Education. In Thursday's section of the quarterly, Steve, I've, I found this, this quote from education. The child's first teacher is the mother. During the period of greatest susceptibility and most rapid development, his education to a great degree is in her hands. And I got to pondering that this week. Janine and I were depression babies. And we grew up as teenagers during World War II. She in France, 
German occupation, me here in this country. The war did something rather drastic. When all the soldiers were away, for the first time in the history of the country, male jobs were taken on by women. And it has never stopped. I don't know just how we came to this understanding, Janine and me, but somehow I decided that when those little girls were growing up, I was going to be the total breadwinner. And I, to this day, can look and say that Janine raised them and raised them right. But you know, my daughters and my grandkids, it's a, it's a family where both parents are working. <laughs> and I'm troubled by that in a way because... If, the, if this quote is spot on, that during the period of greatest susceptibility and most rapid development, if that comes from a child care center instead of the home, Mike, it's not going to be the same. Certainly not. And I, I just wonder, you know, this, this is, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has this as much as the world around it. And um, you, you can see the challenge it gives us as Christian parents in the world we live in today. You know, one of the hopes that I have for today's young adult generation, and I have three kids in that generation, is that they see almost more clearly than my generation or my mother's generation um, what is of lasting value. And I actually have the hope that today's generation will actually return in some way to the ideal that you're talking about and the ideal that we see in the book Education, that one parent, and certainly there are more stay-at-home dads now than there were 20, That's 30, true. or 40 yeah. years ago, yeah. but there will be a parent who steps away from his or her professional ambitions to invest everything they have into their own children. I see that more and more in the young adults that I, I watch in our world today. You know, there's a, an organization called uh, um, Ideal for a New American Dream. And um, the emphasis is stepping away from a material gain driven mm -hmm. culture or society, which has led to the thinking that, well, we've got to have two jobs. We've got to have both parents working so that we can afford this, so that we can do this, so exactly. that we can, you know, maintain whatever, whatever image we have of a life. And I think there are a lot of young people who are seeing the, who are seeing the folly in that, as Solomon might have said, who are seeing the emptiness in that pursuit and instead are attaching value to being with their children in those formative years. Well, may it happen Amen and in that, that direction because I think we have really gone a considerable distance. I can remember even pondering Ellen White's admonition to start a child at seven years of age instead of six, <laughs> you know? And Mike, you're the educator in our midst here. But I can tell you by personal experience that I looked at my first two daughters who did that. They always had an edge of the balance in their schoolwork right on up through college. They seemed to have an advantage of a little maturity there. Their minds were a little further along, their, their attention span and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I thought how fortunate the church is to have had a providence that would give us admonition from the Lord about that, those tender formative years and how to teach them. 
And so much nowadays, you see kids, uh, pre-kindergarten kids in a daycare center, and uh, everybody enrolls in kindergarten. And I said to Janine one day, are we different or what? We not only skipped kindergarten, we skipped the first grade for one year and started them at seven. But as I look back on it, I'm thankful we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christine, who was uh, b born in December, was the, it was hard to do that. <laughs> and we didn't do that. We started her in school at six. But I noticed the difference between her siblings and herself on that balance, Mike. <laughs> well, virtually every state in the country now mandates kindergarten for five-year-olds. For five-year-olds? Well, if a student is five before Labor Day, for example, yep. they are required to be in a certified program. Now, as a parent, you can... I mean, you can actually claim homeschooling, if you will, for that first year and start your child at six. But kindergarten is mandated in virtually every state in the, in the union. And in fact, we're seeing more and more states go to mandatory full day oh, kindergarten my. and not oh, half day. You know, that's the emphasis on this whole early learning. Get kids into school more, uh, more quickly so that they can, you know, they can keep up with all of the other nations that are advancing in the technical fields and all of that yeah. sort of thing. It has little to do with spirituality, though. Next to nothing, really. Next to nothing. Yeah. Um, Lonnie, Lonnie, question. The, the, the model that you just outlined, where the, the father works and the mother is allowed to, to stay home and, 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 and nurture and raise her kids, we, we, we're moving so far away from that model to where we, we now necessitate to have two wage earners in the family. Yeah. And, 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 and that is putting pressure on the family because now I've got to put my kid in daycare instead of being home to raise them. Is that, is that more of things are just costing more in the world now or is that more of the family model has moved away to we have to work harder to get those things that we want out of life? I'll give you an opinion on that, Steve. Janine and I kind of muddled along in our early years, and I like to say that we did Dave Ramsey stuff before there was a Dave Ramsey. We learned early on to live within our means. That meant driving old cars and doing a lot of things, and we did that in our family just so I could work and be the breadwinner and Janine could stay home with the little girls until they got to a certain age. I'm not saying that's a perfect example. I'm just saying that that's what I experience. But I can tell you that if you want to stay out of debt and you want to do things like that, you have to live within your means. Within your means. Amen. Uh, yeah, it's just a fundamental. And I you know, as a church member, offer that as a suggestion to young parents. Live within your means. Yeah, credit, you, you credit cards are an easy path to forget about that, aren't they? Yeah. Or, or the whole idea of purchase by credit, you know, whether it's, exactly. a, whether it's a new vehicle or whether it's a home. I mean, those are things that there's nothing wrong with pursuing them, but uh, we forget that the better part of responsibility, and it's not responsibility to us or to society, it's to our children. The better part of responsibility is to live simply. Yes. And most of us have probably failed at that at least a few times or more. I need to take us a little further here before we run out of time. The family of Jesus. The family of Jesus. Gabriel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit's going to give you a child and you're going to, you're going to have the Savior of the world. Gabriel told her that. And Joseph, who was engaged to her, when he found out that she was pregnant, was terribly disturbed and wanted to somehow, without hurting her, 
have her break that tie with him. And God, in his great providence, gave him a dream at night. And Gabriel was able to say, Joseph, this is the way it is. And Steve, I was absolutely struck in Matthew chapter 1, uh, 18 to 24, that tells us about that. Read the 25th verse. I had never seen it before. Matthew chapter 1, chapter verse, 1 verse 25. Yes. Verse 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Okay. Let me dissect that just a bit. Gabriel had told him in the dream, don't be afraid to marry your, your engaged partner here. Don't be afraid to marry her. But in his spiritual wisdom, he realized that if her pregnancy was a supernatural thing from the Lord, that he needed to allow her to be in that virgin state until Jesus was born. Was born. And I thought that was remarkable. Amen. I, I hadn't tumbled to that before. But he essentially said he did not have sexual relations with his bride until she gave birth to Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. And what yeah. faith, what faith on, on, on both of their sides. On both of their sides. For, yeah. for a virgin to, to, to believe that, that, that I can be blessed and, and be the mother of, 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 my, of my Savior. Because, yeah. because Mary even says, you know, I, uh, I am blessed of all women and, and I will be the mother of my own Savior, right? Right. And, and what faith on, on Joseph's side to believe the angel, to, to, to tell him, look, to be obedient, not to put Mary away, right? Not, yeah. to, not to, uh, 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 to divorce her, but be compassionate and understanding. What faith on what both faith? of their sides? To do I, I agree with you complete, completely, um, Steve. Uh, Joseph was remarkable. Now, we began to understand that Joseph had probably oh, uh, other children from a previous marriage. He probably lost his wife and remarried here. And it's interesting how these siblings uh, interacted with Jesus. We don't know much about it because there's very little about his childhood. But there are a couple references here. Uh, the Nazareth people, when they heard Jesus preach and saw that he was remarkable in, in how he handled the Scripture, they said, well, wait a minute. Is it, isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? And aren't his, aren't his brothers James and so forth and so forth? And we know about, about his sisters and all of that, uh, they knew the family. And it's interesting that in John 7, uh, you pick all that up in, in Matthew 13, but in John 7, we find that these older brothers, including James, who probably was the oldest of them, try to influence Jesus to be more I'll say political and self-serving. In other words, you're not, you're not aligning yourself with the religious leaders and whatnot. You need to do more of that. You know, they really try to instruct Jesus. And as you dig into it further, you find that they really did not believe in Jesus. They saw the wonderful things he was doing, but they did not consider him the Messiah. Flat on, they didn't consider him the Messiah. But Mike, I'd like to give you one text here that shows how that shifted. Now, this is after the resurrection and before the ascension. It's Acts 1, verses, verse 14. Judas, the son of, oh, I'm sorry. 
Judas, the son of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And with his brothers. Yeah. And th there's strong evidence that after the resurrection, these brothers became united with their half-brother Jesus. So much so that the oldest James became what I call the general conference president in the church in Jerusalem. He led as an elder the church in Jerusalem. I'd like to tie off our study here with one other text. Let's turn together to Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 4. What, what, um, what book again, Lonnie? Ephesians oh, 6, Ephesians if you'd read it, please. Verses 1 to 4. Ephesians 6, uh, 1 to Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in, a na in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Very good. Thank you for that. And I'll just uh, paraphrase Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. It talks about husbands, love your wives, and wives, respect your husbands. This is so fundamental, isn't it, Mike? It, it, you know, if, if we took those two verses, those two sections from Ephesians, we would have more happy, spiritually centered families. We're out of time. Uh, thank you, Mike and, uh, and Steve, for being our panelists here. Let us pray. Father in heaven. Thank you for being with us as we've studied this lesson together. May the things we discuss be profitable to all our Sabbath School members. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.